everyone, and welcome back to a, another session of Startup Streamlined. Uh, my name is Lindsay Kara Stencil. I'm a partner in the New Ventures Practice Group here at Thompson Hine. And this week, I am joined by the queen of ESG herself, Ms. Yurgita Ashley. And she's a partner and co-chair of the firm's Public Companies Group and co-chair of the firm's ESG Collaborative, which she'll talk to you, I'm sure, a little bit about here too today. Uh, she focuses her practice on capital markets transactions, SEC compliance, board compliance, ESG, and corporate governance matters. So she is a star. So listen to what she has to say because it is it is real and it is impacting our businesses more and more every day. Uh, today, we're going to examine the potential impacts and challenges um, this paradigm shift could create for public and private companies as they look to employ controls and procedures to collect, evaluate, and report data to ensure accountability and uh, promote social responsibility, socially responsible investing. Uh, we'll also cover some practical approaches today towards ESG, potential resources, and other considerations involved when mitigating risk and meeting the mandates of all the stakeholders involved. So. If you have questions or comments as we rock and roll along, please drop those into the chat. We monitor that and we will either ask them as they pop up or we will hold them to the end, but don't hesitate to ask. There, There is no dumb question here, so please feel free to ask. This is what we're here for today. Um, so with that, let's get started. So, Yurgita, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so honored that you're here today. So why don't you jump right into it here for the, the audience and just set a baseline of very simply what is ESG. Hi Lindsay, thanks for having me here. And ESG is a huge umbrella of a variety of topics that have very little to do with each other. It's everything from climate change to forced labor to waste management, anti-corruption, and also your even traditional governance topics such as stock repurchases, insider trading, and so forth. So like one way to think about it is that everything that used to be compliance is now under the ESG umbrella plus the new topics as they evolve. Wow. And so I know all of our uh, teams out there always love to hear the word compliance, right? People hear it and they almost like, roll their eyes and they're like, man, it's more stuff that we have to do. Um, okay, so that's super helpful. What then, because we have a lot of different folks out in the audience, right? We've got startups, we've got publicly traded companies and everything in between. Um, how does ESG matter to small companies or private companies and do they need to do anything day to day? Well, a really good question. So if you are if you are a public company with a particularly a company with a base of institutional investors, those investors will have very specific expectations as to the company's ESG readiness. But ESG is by far no longer an initiative only for large public companies. And that's for several reasons. So for example, if your company is private equity owned, the private equity fund likely has ESG expectations for its portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. ESG is also being used as a tool to recruit and retain employees. I mean, part of ESG has always been about creating companies where people want to work. Some companies report increased profitability because of the ESG initiatives, and that could be for several reasons, whether it's because of the cost reductions or creating products that are more sustainable or even going into the new business lines. If you're thinking about an exit strategy, whether that's through M&A or the IPO, ESG is also important. So ESG is now being built into M&A acquisition models, both from the risk management perspective, but also in determining of how expensive and difficult it will be to integrate your acquisition and then, then, then it goes to pricing. And then at the IPO stage, a company would be expected to package its ESG initiatives in a way that it meets the rules of the Securities and Exchange Commission, but also satisfies investor expectations. And then, you know, last but not least, 
uh, a lot of smaller companies and private companies are in the large public company supply chain, meaning that they sell products or provide services to large public companies. And as these large public companies build their ESG compliance programs and make their ESG goals and commitments, they increasingly push ESG requirements down their supply chains. And that's, you know, that's done, usually done through contractual commitments. It can also be part of the company's procurement process. Wow. So what I'm hearing then is it's really something that isn't just a buzzword that we see in the media every day, right? This is a thing that impacts business, no matter if you're a startup or if you're a publicly traded company or you're somewhere in between. That's effectively what I'm, I'm hearing then. So if that's the case, how does someone, let's start from the baseline of how does someone get started? We'll come back to later, you know, if you've got a plan in place and you're thinking about modifications, but how do you even get started if you haven't, you're just getting yourself started? You've got a million and one things you've got to worry about. And now this ESG thing is thrown on top of the pile. So an ESG, another really good question. So an ESG, an ESG program cannot be implemented overnight. It's, it's definitely a journey and to take takes time, it takes a lot of people and resources. Now, good news is that a lot of companies are just getting started. So part of it is just starting someplace and then building and improving as you go along. So I'll, I will run through sort of main elements of the ESG program. And then if anybody has any questions about any of them, we can talk more about it. So it's it's a long list, seven or nine, depending on how you count. But first of all, identify the ESG issues that are most important to your company and why you're choosing to invest in ESG. The ESG umbrella is massive and not every issue is relevant to every company. So this ESG priority assessment, you can have a consultant do it, but it's also something that can be done internally with some guidance if you're trying to cut down costs and you don't have an unlimited budget to do this. So then once the focus areas are identified, assess what the company is already doing. And many companies find that they do more than they think that they do. And and at that point, it's just taking all those various pieces and pulling them together and then adding a little bit more. Third, select ESG metrics and ESG frameworks. So SASB and TCFD are emerging as the main ESG frameworks. SASB is basically a collection of 77 standards based on your industry. So if you are a biotech company or if you're a manufacturing company, you go to the specific standard, you look at what are materi- deemed to be material for your industry, and then you determine whether or not it's actually material for your company, and then you go with it. If it's TCFD is designed to be for climate reporting, and that's it's a building block of the SEC's proposed climate change rules, definitely something that's getting a lot of prominence now, for human rights assessment, UN sustainability development goals is a framework that's still being used. So then once you have the framework, collect data, much more challenging than it sounds, right? Yes. A lot of times it's centralized, many times it's not available. Quite a process and like pulling the team together and getting those pieces together. The next piece is very important and they cannot over sort of oversell it. It's it's in, it's incredibly important to put governance structures around ESG. And what I'm thinking about there, it's it's everything from getting the buy-in from your board and C suite to sort of creating these cross functional ESG working groups throughout the organization, but also to putting processes in place for verification of your ESG data. Those can look differently. A lot of times it's like tie out binders or sub certification processes. They might include um, audit or the disclosure committee review. It's it's also important to have like some sort of controls matrix or mapping. Could be similar to Sarbanes Oxley reporting, doesn't have to be. 
And then once you have the data and once you're comfortable with the accuracy of the data, then you can move to ESG messaging, whether it's on the website, internal report, external report, press releases. In any of those cases, look out for the greenwashing litigation risks because you can have FTC marketing claims, you can have securities disclosure issues, a, a lot there. So sort of building the legal review of, of somebody who's doing that type of work, whether it's internal or external, I think it's important for the controls and the process. And then finally, again, very important, uh, incorporate ESG into the company's strategic business plan and the company's risk management strategy. So the, comp the ESG programs are the effective are the ones that are more than check the box exercises. It's the, it's, it's the ones that actually go to the long-term profitability and the long-time shareholder value creation. Yeah, which is uh, all the rage right now in the, in the news. So that was all super helpful. And I think if I'm hearing you correctly, right, I mean, even for the folks that are just getting started or, um, you know, we're only a couple of years into it, into it that might be out there, they can still institute some of these processes early on and they can figure out ways to track data early on and institute it into their strategic plan and into their system so that they can roll it up to, you know, particularly large publicly traded companies that might need that data. And that's a key thing and a key component in their contract. So there's a lot of meat and potatoes that you just dropped on us. That was a whole bunch of uh, <laughs> bunch of material. So now we've seen in, you know, if you pay attention to the Wall Street Journal and, you know, all of those, uh, you know, every news channel imaginable, we see, you know, ESG, litigation in terms of like, hey, let's promote ESG within these companies and it's not happening. So what are we seeing when, you touched on this a little bit, but how does that really arise? Like where does the, where are the typical problems when someone isn't adhering to ESG standards and reporting metrics? What, what result? How does that actually come to be? Is that a disgruntled shareholder or otherwise? Yeah, so that's definitely something to keep an eye on because we have state attorney general actions, we have more activity and sort of like private litigation space. And the more of these disclosures are getting pushed out, we expect that we're going to see regulatory actions as well, whether it's at the DOJ level or the Securities and Exchange Commission level. So when you're looking at those disclosures, it's, it's looking for accuracy, it's looking for sort of limiting your data appropriate disclaimers. So for example, if you are reporting your greenhouse gas emissions, right? And then you are saying like, hey, mine are so much less than the industry standard. You, ha you have to look that, that it's a comparison of apples to apples, right? It, are you only measuring your scope one and scope two? And then industry standard includes some companies that are also measuring part of the scope three. Or for example, like what's what are your organizational boundaries? So your recent acquisitions included, are you estimating cost to some of this data? How old is the data? So footnotes, footnotes and disclaimers, like targeted specific disclaimers are your best friend. And of course, looking at the green guides by FTC, there are very specific marketing things and evidence that you need to have to be able to say thanks. So it's, it, it, it's worth investing the time up front to sort of avoid some of these issues down the road. Understood. So I should have asked this up front, but how long has ESG and ESG monitoring really been around? Because I feel like it's come to the forefront much more recently, but it sounds like it's been around for a hot minute. For decades, sort of technically speaking, but you know, like, just looking at my own practice, for example, seven years ago when I was looking at ESG, I was looking at the ESG and sustainability reports that were mostly like these feel good stories about sure. a community impact or sort of what the company is doing on the volunteering side that wasn't really tied to the financial metrics. What happened within the last two years is an outcry from the institutional investors and the 
push to tying these ESG goals to the company's financial performance. Interesting. Okay, so that kind of brings me to my next bucket of questions because this has been around for a long time. And now we see um, companies that they say, hey, look, like we have to make this part of our business plan. It's statutorily mandated. But then we have new anti-ESG litigation and rule sets popping up. So can you tell us a, a, you know, a baseline, what, what is that looking like? And then we'll talk about you know, how could that impact things going forward? Well, there is definitely an, an ESG camp and also an anti-ESG camp, and companies have to navigate both. There are no easy answers. So on one hand, we have anti-discrimination, diversity, and other employment laws. We have regulations relating to plastics use, proposed climate change disclosures, and other environmental regulations. We also have laws that relate to supply chains, such as the California Supply Chain Transparency Act or the New York's proposed Fashion Sustainability Act, so a lot on the ESG side. And then that's even before getting on sort of what NASDAQ is doing or what the SEC is thinking about. And the, as everybody knows about the SEC's um, climate change disclosure proposal, but it's, it's more than that. There are also pending regulations relating to cybersecurity, insider trading, stock repurchases, as well as some expectation that the SEC will be doing more on the board leadership and um talent management, human capital. And then, as you said, like there is on the other side, we also have states such as Texas, Louisiana, West Virginia, there are many others that are enacting or proposing laws that prohibit state funds from ESG investing or that prohibit state governments from doing business with companies that are deemed to discriminate against certain industries, such as fo the fossil fuel industry. And navigating this map, I think it's important to have alignment among different parts of the organization. So for example, the group that's working on your ESG report and also your finance team or your business team that's actually doing business with these state government agencies. And they think it also calls for sort of the company-wide stance on these issues. Basically, the company's core set of values, so to speak. Okay. And so along the lines of anti-ESG laws, what are people actually trying to get at? Is it, and this is maybe conjecture, like is this, is this a political move where people are trying to say, well, we're not this, or is it something beyond that? Like, what is your sense of that? Well, in a way, sort of, so even when the, this is on the ESG front, right? But even when the SEC enacts climate disclosure law, right? It's a, it's a disclosure law, but it's also going to have a substantive impact of changing the way the companies do business. Because I don't think any company will want to come out and say, no, we don't have any directors that know what climate risks are. Right. No, they'll be like either be educating the board or adding the directors who have the climate expertise. And so, so the ESG is anti-ESG movement is about really sort of opposing this trend by litigation through disclosure and other matters to sort of impose. It's often viewed that it's imposing a huge burden on the smaller companies. And there is some truth to it to sort of comply with all of these ESG requirements. But as, so Lindsay, you might not know this, but the SEC estimates that for a company to comply only with the SEC's climate change disclosure rule, one one law, one regulation, it would take 4,000 hours. So how many smaller companies can devote 4,000 hours? So It's two full-time people. That's wild. Yep. Okay, continue, sorry. And no, like, and there is, 
there is a lot of regulation both in the United States as well as overseas. So Europe is further ahead. Europe has corporate proposed corporate sustainability directives. There are ESG due diligence laws that are already either proposed or passed, whether in the European Union or Germany. So we think that is especially like larger companies or global companies also have to think about how to manage them and at what point do they have budget and resources to devote to it. So while some companies are already like working on the proposed disclosures and doing gap assessments, whether it's against the SEC's proposed rule or the European rule proposals, or even sort of like investing on the ESG due diligence processes for the companies that don't have those resources. I think you can you can think about like what are the common elements, so what are the common building blocks. So that SAS being TCFD framework that I was talking about, it's not enough, it's not comprehensive, but it does sort of the baseline that both the SECs and the European proposals have in there, and also the standards that global standards that are international sustainability standards board is proposing, that's part of those as well. Oh, this is a lot. Um, so for maybe our, I, I want to ask a couple questions here, but like how does someone maybe, um, if there's disconnect between those rule sets, like there's a disconnect between uh, the SEC rules and regulations, and there's a disconnect between, you know, some of these other state rules that are coming out, how is a company, startup, funder, large corporation, how are they supposed to make a decision? What are they supposed to do? Like, what if they actually fought fly in the face of each other? Who are, who are they supposed to comply with? All. <laughs> you know? Not sure that that's going to be a satisfying answer, which no. is like there is no there is no one ESG program, like no one size fits all sure. for the ESG program. So like it definitely depends on the company's business, industry, employee base, size, geographic footprint, inv investors, customers, and so forth. Right. So so if you're looking at the regulations and if your company is in three states and there are conflicting regulations, you can sort of, you can tailor it more one-on-one, -on -one, right? But if it's a global company or it's a company that's in all 50 states, then you sort of, you still have to comply with the law, right? But, but for the things that are less than the law, I think you adopt sort of a company-wide stance on those issues and then you go with it. And of, and of course, there is a lot that's happening sort of behind the public eye, right? There are trade organizations and sort of other ways to sort of try to work and influence rulemaking and leg legislative making as well. And there is a lot of activity there also. That makes sense. So I guess, you know, as we're starting to turn the corner towards the tail end of our discussion here, I mean, you don't get this, do you, I, I ask you differently, do you get the sense that ESG is here to stay or is this anti-ESG legislation going to sort of roll like thunder across the United States? I think ESG is definitely here to stay. I think the question is, and it's not an important question, but whether or not we're going to call it ESG or if we're going to call yeah. it something else, but the concept, the idea is here to stay. And I do think that there is a lot of value in sort of taking charge of your ESG process, because if you come up with a reasonable process and develop a reasonable set of disclosures, then you can provide that package to all your customers. And that's especially applicable to private companies, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of being subject to 50 different requests from 50 different customers that are asking you to slice and dice the data in different ways or asking you for the data that you don't have. So there is, there is value in sort of getting upfront of these issues. Excellent. So um, that is super helpful. So what do you think coming back to like our startup friends here and having to interact with some of this, in addition to 
figuring out how to integrate this in early on? What are some other suggestions in the ESG space or best practices that you might suggest for some of those folks rolling forward? So there are some there are some resources that are available, right? So for example, the stock stock exchanges have some ESG materials that are quite good. Partnering with your private equity fund sometimes can be really helpful. Some of these frameworks that they talked about, and also GHG protocol, which is widely used for measuring greenhouse emissions, all of them are available online. There are some consulting resources free or inexpensive that are available online we can also help so there is so there is a lot of help out there and at least as sort of like as far as figuring out where to get started and how to go from there i'll go back to like it being important to build a program and sort of scale down the program get get started someplace I think one thing that smaller companies want to think about, startups, is take a look at your commercial contracts. A lot of times they will include provisions that are ESG related. So some that I have been seeing lately is requiring the companies to provide their emissions calculations, diverse the data, backup for that. So some contracts go further than that and require, for example, um, ESG commitments, you're going to reduce your emissions by X percentage by X year, or asking companies to join various ESG initiatives, like the science-based target initiative, which is an audit part of the work that you do. So the, so the value in sort of building this out is to get ahead of these issues before it becomes a fire drill when you see it an important customer contract. Right, because you get so excited to get that really big amazing agreement and then you get that big really amazing agreement so you have to deal with all the things that come along with it so that's super helpful and you know linda and it can be challenging for example for, for legal counsel or cfo who might be in charge of this because like a lot of times the business person will be willing to make that commitment and sometimes when i get those phone calls the conversation is like but you don't have any data yet like <laughs> you know like it so it's so it's worth assessing who your customer base is and sort of thinking about those issues ahead of time. 100%. And thinking about who, because a lot of the startups who take on funding, yes, they have client customers, and then their investor in some way is also their customer. So they have to figure out how to roll that data up. Exactly. Them also. So excellent. So we only have about a minute and a half left here, but, you know, what is your primary closing thought on this to the masses when they're thinking about this and maybe they've got, you know, the start of a program and they're not sure if it's right? What do you, what would be your baseline advice to them? So, so two things, get started, scale it down, but also when building the program, don't make it too rigid. ESG issues are not static. The new issues constantly pop up. We saw supply chain issues, abortion, the Russia-Ukraine war just this year. So like agility of the program is, is also important. But you're not alone. You're not behind. There are lots of companies that are in the same situation right now. 100%. So Yurgita, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. If you are feeling, if you're listening out there and you're like, holy smokes, that was a lot, reach out to Yurgita and her team because they are the best of the best at this, right? I mean, they can help guide you through what you need to do, what you don't need to do, and um, reduce the stress that way. You know, ask for help when help is needed. So thank you so much for participating today. I really appreciate it. This was super um, informative and I think really helpful for a lot of the companies out there. Thanks everybody and Lindsay, great talking with you as always. Same, same. So this uh, concludes today's discussion. Uh, this webinar, as you probably saw, was recorded and will be available for you to review in our library of recordings on Thompson Pines YouTube channel. So like, subscribe, and ring that bell so that you can get all of the updates that we post there from time to time. 
we want to obviously thank you for attending today's program and again extend a special thank you to your Gita uh, for giving us some of her time and her expertise and knowledge. Uh, when the webinar ends, you'll get asked to answer a few short questions that helps us get better and provide you better information that you want to hear about from day to day and topics that we might not think are hot by notice for you. But if you tell us, that's super great. Um, so again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day and go build. Ha, ha, ha.